we are now we are now moving thanks a lot we are now moving to the next uh, session marco uh, basetto from the federal reserve bank of minneapolis will, will present he is his research focuses on game theory macroeconomics and the design and consistency of macroeconomic policies and he has made an attempt as you will see to look at the complexity of a monetary union with 40 budget constraints like the, the, the european monetary union and so I'm really uh, curious and fascinated uh, that, that, uh, about this, this uh, presentation. So, Marco, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I was trying to get rid of uh, the side uh, panel on PDF. Ah, here we go. Very good. Um, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, have a chance to present my work here. Um, and uh, I want to mention that uh, I'd be happy to entertain questions as they go along. Uh, so, Klaus, if you see a question that uh, fits well with the floor, uh, feel free to interrupt me and then we can have a longer discussion afterwards. But, um, of course, I'm not going to monitor the chat myself <laughs> while I talk. Okay. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Gerardo Caracciolo, who's a PhD student at UCL. He's currently on the market. He's a fantastic guy. Um, if you are on the market for a, um, uh, you know, on the junior market, you should definitely uh, take a look at his file. Let me see if I can move this because it's not moving for me at the moment. Very good. Is it moving for you? Can you see my second slide, Klaus? Yes, all good. Excellent, thank you. So, what's the motivation for uh, for this project? Um, there's uh, uh, a lot of research uh, that has been devoted to the uh, issue that monetary and fiscal policy are connected by a common budget constraint. Um, I tend to think about one of the main contributions as being. Uh, Sergeant and Wallace's unpleasant um, monetary arithmetic that was recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee. But um, you know, when every time I, I present, Sergeant sort of thinks that uh, you know this uh, issue goes back uh, centuries, and that's true. Certainly, uh, you know, even with the creation of Bank of England uh, originally centuries ago, and even before, uh, it was uh, well understood that uh, central banks. Uh, played an important fiscal role. Um, more recently, uh, the fiscal theory of the price level has uh, uh, devoted uh, a lot of attention uh, to the question of how uh, fiscal policy uh, can, uh, uh, in some dimensions, help in uh, determining uh, uh, the price level. So uh, making sure that uh, we're not subject to uh, the whims uh, of expectations and that there is an anchor that will make sure that um, prices uh, uh, remain uh, stable in some way, but at the same time, uh, potentially creating problems for monetary policy. And let me remind you, by the way, that everything that I'm saying today uh, reflects my own views and not those of the Minneapolis Fed or the Federal Reserve System. Um, so the fiscal theory and unpleasant monetary arithmetic emphasize the single budget constraint. Um, there's been uh, a more recent work trying to split the budget constraint of uh, uh, monetary and fiscal authorities and looking at uh, potential implications from thinking about how this common budget constraint arises in an environment in which the two partially have uh, uh, a little bit of uh, independence, maybe in their own budget constraint. And this was notably started from uh, by SIMS. I have uh, some uh, earlier work uh, myself uh, uh, with uh, with Todd Messer um, and Pier Paolo Benigno has work. And uh, uh, here, uh, this heading that I picked, uh, New Style Central Banking, is something that Ricardo Ris came up with. Uh, he he has a, a good taste for a, a catchy name, so I'm I'm gonna take it from him. Now the question um, for me, so you know, the, the next step is, uh, so the, the new style central banking was about uh, say the Fed and the US Treasury. There are two agencies uh, um, to some extent, you, you can argue uh, the, I mean, legally the Fed is not a government agency, although the board is, but that's certainly heavily regulated by, by the government. So there are kind of two government sanctioned entities 
um, and they are interacting. Now, things become a lot more exciting in some dimension when you start thinking about the Eurozone, and that's why um, Gerardo and I started uh, uh, thinking about this project. Um, in the Eurozone, it's not just uh, uh, one central bank and uh, uh, one uh, government uh, interacting with each other, but there are actually 40 players. Uh, there are the 19 national treasuries, uh, plus the European Union. The European Union is a relatively small fiscal player, uh, becoming bigger by uh, by the day, um, with uh, some of the issues that Evi uh, talked about. Um, then there's the European Central Bank, but also uh, something that uh, may be a little bit underappreciated um, is uh, that there are also 19 national central banks. Um, and uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, today a little bit about what they do um, or they don't do. Um, so what's chosen centrally and uh, what's chosen at the level of the National Central Bank. But what's gonna be very important is that each of them um, will have uh, its own, uh, uh, does have its own uh, uh, budget constraint. Um, so, you know, there isn't a single um, central bank with a single budget constraint uh, in, uh, in the European Union the way there is, uh, um, say, for instance, in the case of the Fed. Now, technically, the regional Feds have also their own budget, but everything is uh, shared at the end of the day, so that's fairly irrelevant. There are some minor complications, but you know, everybody understands that if uh, the New York Fed made losses, say, on Maiden Lane, that was uh, one of the things that was on their books, they would be covered by the system as a whole. It's less obvious in the case of the ECB. Um, and so the key question for me uh, is, uh, is going to be twofold. One is kind of more technical. How does seniorage, so the profits from running a central bank, flow uh, from the monetary authority to the budget of each country? Because ultimately, these funds end up uh, at the Treasury. Um, the profits are emitted to the Treasury. And the question is, how does that happen? Um, but the second, maybe more important question is, uh, um, who's paying if a member country defaults on its debt? So uh, through uh, various programs, the uh, euro system, so the ECB along with the national central banks have been uh, uh, buying um, quite a, uh, a big amount of, uh, of government debt. Um, that government debt may be subject to default, hopefully not, but you know, Greece did default. And the question is, uh, um, who's going to bear the cost of that? Um, uh, which taxpayer um, will will have to uh, uh, prop up money uh, uh, to account for the fact that there's going to be less profits coming from the central bank, or maybe even losses? So, in my talk, I'm going to focus uh, on uh, uh, two programs the public sector purchase program and the pandemic emergency purchase program. Why these two? Because these are the programs where the risk is not supposed to be shared. Uh, for many of the other programs, the risk uh, is, uh, uh, is shared uh, explicitly at the level of the Eurozone. So it's kind of uh, closer to the common budget. There's a one central bank, if you want, with a common budget constraint. There are still 19 Treasure is in the background, but you know they're getting just their share of uh, profits or potentially losses. Um, for PSPP and PEPP, the rules are quite different. Uh, the rules uh, uh, work as follows: 20% uh, of uh, the size of these programs uh, is undertaken directly by the European Central Bank at the European level, and for 10%, they're buying uh, supranational bonds. For 10%, they're buying national bonds. These uh, are common, uh, so the, sh the risk on this is common, shared according to the capital key. Uh, that's not um, what I'm going to be focusing on. I'm going to focus on the remaining 80%. For the remaining 80%, each national central bank is buying their own treasuries bonds. So Bank of Italy is buying Italian bonds, uh, the Bundesbank is buying German bonds, uh, Bank of Portugal is buying Portuguese bonds, and so on and so forth, the Finnish. National Bank uh, is uh, um, buying uh, Finnish bonds. The risk of this 80% is not supposed to be shared. Uh, it's supposed to remain with the National Central Bank that bought the bonds. So if Italy defaults, 
Um, and, uh, you know, I apologize if I'm picking uh, uh, big countries, um, but, you know, I did mention Portugal and Finland. I'm going to try to use uh, uh, Italy and Germany as my main example, partly because I'm originally from Italy. Um, so if Italy defaults, um, it's Bank of Italy that should uh, remain on the hook for uh, those uh, uh, losses that are going to rise on its books um, due to the fact uh, that now those assets are worth less. Um, so the question here is going to be to what extent that holds in a world in which uh, really at the end of the day, there's just one consolidated budget constraint. So let me go through a little bit in practice because this is going to be somewhat important um, on how uh, this works in practice. So uh, there are two possibilities. So I'm going to use uh, Bank of Italy as my workhorse example. And uh, uh, so there are two options. They can buy these bonds from, they're going to buy them from the private sector. This is going to come typically from a bank or, you know, it could come from somebody else who has a relationship with a bank. Um, and uh, uh, the, the question is, where do these, flow, these uh, you know, when Bank of Italy buys, where are these, uh, the counter, uh, the payment for those bonds uh, uh, going to end up? If they're buying them from an Italian bank, then what happens is Bank of Italy is get, acquiring the bond and it's issuing reserves. Um, of course, euros, uh, reserves are in euros, so there's, there has to be a mechanism that makes sure that a euro is a euro, no matter whether it's Italy or Bank of Italy or Bundesbank. Uh, but technically, from uh, the budgetary perspective, these reserves are the liabilities of Bank of Italy. Um, and so that's where they sit on, on the balance sheet. Things are a little bit different if Bank of Italy buys the same bond from a German bank. Then Bank of Italy acquires the bond. That's not different. But because it's a German bank, it's a Bundesbank that is issuing the reserves that are going to show up on the uh, as the payment for uh, for this asset. Um, and uh, and then of course there has to be some mechanism for equilibrating the fact that now Bank of Italy has an asset and the Bundesbank has a liability that comes in the form of uh, 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 the target two. Uh, balance. So what happens is uh, uh, Bank of Italy um, is going to acquire a target two liability that matches uh, the asset that they just bought, the, uh, the bond, and the Bundesbank will get a target two asset uh, um, that matches the liability that they acquired, which is the reserves that they issue to the banks. All these target two flaws uh, are netted out of the ECB system, so technically those are uh, liabilities and assets against the ECB. As you will see in my model, uh, I will short circuit that. Um, it's somewhat important for netting purposes, but it's not important for the economics of uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, and uh, um, and so, you know, one of the questions here is uh, how is this going to uh, interact with the, with the target two system? Now, the target two system um, pays uh, interest. Um, although not currently, but um, it, uh, in principle, it pays interest uh, at uh, the marginal refinancing operation rate, which is the top of the corridor uh, set uh, by uh, the ECB. Um, and then, uh, you know, Bank of Italy is going to um, uh, have to pay this uh, uh, interest, um, but if the interest on government that is above that rate, uh, which it currently is, then uh, they will uh, uh, that profit is uh, is profit for Bank of Italy. If it makes a loss, either because the interest rate is below or because it um, suffers from a haircut, that would uh, would show up on its balance sheet that way. Positions I'm talking about are big, um, so that's going to be uh, important. Um, we are uh, currently thinking about how uh, to design experiments to match uh, this magnitude. I'm going to show you um, an experiment at the end, and you see that the effect there is uh, is much smaller. So there also, uh, there's a question of how we uh, account for properly for uh, for this uh, magnitude. So uh, currently, um, the uh, so the euro system is uh, um, uh, holding uh, almost 40% of GDP of uh, Italian debt, um, and the target two liability of Bank of Italy against uh, uh, the, uh, the ECB is 30% uh, uh, of uh, GDP. Um, so it's it's a pretty big. Now this uh, uh, this target two liability has uh, two key characteristics from uh, our perspective. 
So one is, uh, so this is variable rate, I, I told you, it varies with uh, um, the uh, corridor set by DCB, um, but it's uh, that of infinite maturity. There's never, um, unless uh, uh, a breakup of the Eurozone happened, and people have studied this, uh, uh, there's a big literature on, on target two uh, balances, thinking exactly about what happens uh, with a breakup. But, that's not going to be on the table for me. I'm not going to be entertaining a breakup of the Eurozone. I'm going to be studying what happens if the Euro remains as it's uh, uh, as it currently is supposed to. Uh, so in that case, this debt never becomes due. Um, it re will remain on the books of, uh, um, of debt in the case of, say, uh, Bank of Italy, um, credit in the case of the Bundesbank, it will remain on the books there. It may grow and grow. And that's the other uh, aspect that is interesting. There's not a limit uh, that that um, can go, uh, you know, to 600% uh, in principle, to 600% of uh, GDP, um, and uh, there's no uh, automatic mechanism for why that uh, should ever uh, be repaid um, in one way or another. Of course, it, it's still accruing interest. Now, before quantitative easing, um, and you know, this is something that the literature has addressed. Um, there, there's a camp that says this makes total sense. It's just a counterpart for uh, the reserves that are issued. So yes, uh, you know, if uh, reserves in Germany uh, blow up, um, then uh, there's this matching uh, um, asset um, that helps uh, the Bundesbank pay those, uh, uh, the interest that they would have to pay on all these reserves. And that's the target two system is at the heart of making sure that a euro is a euro, um, no matter who's issuing it. Um, because the moment um, you put a cap, then there's a question, how does, uh, what happens uh, if a bank of Italy hits a cap and cannot um, you know, issue more euros to, to its banks? Um, or vice versa, uh, accept uh, payment, that's the more relevant one, uh, and transfer those funds uh, to, to a German bank. Things become more complicated now because uh, this uh, uh, risk so uh, that um, is uh, coming from buying all these assets is not supposed to be shared. When it was shared, uh, um, it, the asset side was kind of boring. And then it was just a matter of uh, divvying up properly the uh, payments on the reserves. Now it's it's different. So now it's time for me to get uh, to the model. So I'm going to have two countries. Um, why two? Because uh, uh, you know this is uh, uh, we want to keep it simple. We don't need 40 countries to make a, a theoretical point. So the countries are going to be called A and B. Um, Think of A as the country that never defaults and B the country that might or might not default. Um, they each have their own country and, uh, sorry, their, of course, their own treasury and their own national central bank, but the national central banks of uh, country A and B are joined in a currency union. What does that mean? I'll show you in a second. It means that uh, uh, a number of decisions will be undertaken at the level of uh, the currency union. So in particular, the obvious one is uh, it's not each individual central bank that decides how many bonds of their own country they're going to buy. So Bank of Italy can not go and buy 300% of GDP of uh, uh, Italian debt. Not that there is that much, uh, but whatever, uh, you know, 100% of GDP of Italian debt unilaterally. No, that's chosen at, uh, centrally how much uh, that program um, is buying. I'm going to abstract from the European Union. I told you it's kind of a small player. I'm also abstracting from DCB because I want to focus specifically on this, this issue of uh, distribution uh, between uh, national central banks. Um, and uh, the only role there for, uh, for a central system is uh, making some decisions. And I'm going to be explicit about that. So now I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at um, budget constraints for all these players. I'm going to focus on who's making decisions and uh, looking at various scenarios about how those are going to play out. So here's, uh, to begin with, the flow budget constraint for uh, uh, super simplified, of course, to keep things uh, uh, understandable for, uh, um, for a national treasury. So the national treasury comes uh, into the period with uh, some debt, BI T minus one, which is due. If they repay it in full, that's great. 
they might default. So it is the an indicator function that says uh, that it's equal to one if they default, then there's some haircut delta that they're gonna impose uh, on the creditors. How do they repay this debt? Well, they can uh, raise taxes. Thinks this uh, really is the primary surplus. I'm not uh, having explicitly government spending in there. So this is uh, the amount by which taxes exceed uh, um, the uh, uh, spending. Uh, of course, it can be negative, can be a primary deficit. SIT are remittances that are gonna come from the National Central Bank. So these are the profits that are being distributed from the National Central Bank to the treasury of country I. And of course they can borrow more. Here, government debt is all one period debt. That's because I'm focusing on default risk. Um, my earlier paper with Todd Messer was about uh, um, maturity uh, risk, mismatching maturities between uh, the assets and the liabilities of the central bank. Um, and so there, of course, long-term debt is important, but not for the considerations I'm gonna make today. So uh, I'm for simplicity, I'm gonna have one period debt. As I mentioned, country A never defaults, so IT will always be zero. Country B may default. And of course, the interest rate you can see is indexed by I, by country I, so that can be A or B. Um, and that's, um, you know, we reflect the risk of, uh, of default. That was uh, the fiscal authorities. Let me show you first uh, the budget constraint of the euro system as a whole um, uh, on the monetary side, um, and then I'm gonna break it up between the two countries. What does the euro system as a whole do? Um, the main liabilities are gonna be currency circulation, MT, so they can uh, finance themselves by issuing more currency, or they can finance themselves by issuing more bank reserves, and those are gonna be the XT. Um, bank reserves may pay interest, um, it could be positive, it could also be negative, as uh, it currently is. Um, with uh, with these funds, they're buying bonds of country A, they're buying bonds of country B, um, and uh, uh, they're potentially buying uh, um, private assets. You know, think about before uh, all these programs were arise, one of the main uh, uh, assets uh, on the books of the Euro system were loans to banks. Um, and those are still uh, to some extent, although with a magnitude of reserves, that's uh, you know um, a little less um, prevalent now, but that was one of the main uh, factors before. So we're gonna have it. I'm gonna abstract from default risk on those. So you can see those pay interest at the same rate as uh, uh, the risk-free bonds. Um, that also means I'm abstracting from the liquidity reasons for this version at least of the paper that uh, may drive a wedge between, that do drive a wedge between the interest rate on German bonds and uh, and on private um, assets. And then of course the Euro system pays uh, um, dividends to uh, the two countries, country A and country B. You can, so this is period by period. You can sum up um, all these periods and compute a, a present value budget constraint from now to the infinite future for the Euro system. And this is what it looks like. It says the Euro system is currently sitting on some assets issued by bonds issued by country A, bonds issued by country B, the private assets. It has some liabilities on its books, currency and bank reserves. Um, and uh, uh, to the extent that, um, uh, so assets are more or less than liabilities, what else is on their books? Well, they're gonna pay dividends. Think of them as dividends, these uh, senior age transfers that they're paying to country A and B, not in this period, but in all future periods as well. So that's a present value. Z0S is kind of stochastic discount factor. That just means it's a way of uh, taking into proper account uh, the discounting. Um, and uh, they're also making uh, uh, profits to the extent that um, government bonds pay a positive interest rate and currency pays zero interest rate. That's one source of uh, uh, profits um, now and for the indefinite future, of course, you wanna discount all those profits. They're part of the assets of, uh, of running a central bank. Same for our bank reserves to the extent that bank reserves pay an interest that is below the interest on, on the assets uh, that uh, the Euro system has on its books. So that's another source of, uh, potentially uh, another source of uh, profits. Now there's a, a term highlighted in red. Um, this term is uh, 
what happens uh, captures the following. So what happens uh, if the euro system rolls over its debt for the indefinite future um, and never um, never asks the treasuries to pay it back? That's something that we usually don't think about, um, and that's a good reason. Um, if I'm a private individual, right, then the European system, I don't want to roll over my uh, assets indefinitely. Uh, eventually, you know, I want to eat some uh, some of it. There's uh, no point in holding assets and uh, never, ever, ever touching them again. Um, Normally, if we think about a central bank, it's a little less clear because kind of the central bank and the treasury are united in a single budget constraint. So does it really matter if they do? And the answer is, if there's one treasury and one national central bank, the answer is no. And I'm going to show it to you right now, because if you consolidate the fiscal authorities of the eurozone, there's a matching term here. So it doesn't matter. Think of it this way: it doesn't matter if uh, the ECB remits its profits period by period to the treasury, or it just accumulates ever-expanding uh, uh, bonds uh, and never asks the treasury to pay them back. It's the same thing. It's resources that the treasury does not have to come up with with taxes. And so normally, when we do one national central bank and one uh, um, uh, one uh, 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 national uh, treasury, we neglect this term because uh, uh, it's kind of uh, without loss of generality to think that these uh, profits are paid out. Things are different now because uh, um, there are two countries in, in my model. And so the question is which country's debt is, uh, um, is blowing up over time matters. Uh, if the ECB holds only one type of those, uh, uh, those assets, that's the treasury that gets uh, to expand its balance sheet. And so that's part of what's going to happen. And so now it's time to break up and that euro system into the national central banks. So the only difference here is uh, thinking about, so who's choosing what um, and uh, um, and what's what does break up means? So we have currency issued by um, the euro system as a whole. Um, that's chosen. So MIT is chosen by uh, the euro system. How much currency there is out there? Um, the uh, the only thing is uh, uh, it's a liability that is shared. So it's uh, shared across, uh, according to the capital key. For uh, bank reserves, likewise, uh, those uh, the amount of bank reserves is another thing that is uh, um, chosen uh, at the um, at the ECB level. Now, exactly the split is not chosen at the ECB level. That's going to be driven by the demand for bank deposits that could be asymmetric between uh, Germany, Italy, Finland, uh, uh, Portugal, uh, Ireland, and so on and so forth. But the overall amount XIT, um, is, sorry, XT, the sum of the XITs, is, is, uh, is chosen centrally. Now, there's this tau IT that precisely captures the fact that if there's more demand of uh, uh, bank deposits, uh, that's going to mean uh, um, the counterparty of that is going to be a target to uh, asset. Um, and so tau IT is the target to balance for the Bundesbank that will make sure that um, it will somehow restore symmetry to the extent that the uh, the differences in XITs are driven by differences uh, in uh, um, in, the, in the demand for deposits. We're going to be interested in the uh, counterparty, which is uh, uh, what happens if there are differences in the assets of these national central banks. And so let's take a look at the assets. The assets are the bonds that uh, are bought. So B bar IT, that's the bonds of country I bought by the national central bank of country I. Um, and uh, um, those are potentially subject to default. That's going to be the key question that I'm, I'm going to be after. Now, the amount B bar I is under control of the uh, ECB system as a whole. The, the size of uh, the PSPP and PEPP is chosen centrally. What's not chosen centrally is the default. So that's one of the things that is under control of uh, the, each individual country. The other aspect is how these profits are distributed out. The timing of those profit payments and potentially the amount of those uh, profit payments 
is uh, um, under control of the individual central banks. I'll, I'll come to that um, in, in a second. Um, so those are the two elements, the default and the senior edge uh, uh, remittances that are under the control of the national central banks. That's where uh, everything is going to play out. Now, where's the, you know, where's the valve? So suppose uh, delta, so suppose the haircut delta is imposed. Um, where is, uh, what's going to happen? And that's the question I'm going to come after now. So what I did here is just, I rolled over again that uh, period by period budget constraint forward into a single present value budget constraint, recognizing that if there's a default, say by uh, the Italian treasury today, that has an effect on the assets of Bank of Italy, and that uh, could uh, mean uh, um, that various things are going to happen either now or in the future. It doesn't have, uh, you know, a loss doesn't have to be covered immediately, but it, and there, there has to be some, something that makes up for the shortfall. So let me first tell you so what is supposed to happen um, according to, you know, kind of the if, if the risk is not to be shared. So the risk of this loss has to remain with the Italian taxpayer? Well, the answer is simple. Um, what should happen is that the present value of uh, transfers from Bank of Italy to the Italian Treasury should go down. And those are, so the red highlights this adjustment. So there are fewer assets because uh, uh, there's been this haircut. So now Bank of Italy realized the loss on their holdings of Italian debt. If they're gonna remit less profits to the Italian Treasury, um, in a matching amount, that's the end of the story. Uh, so that means, uh, you know, the Italian treasury has imposed this loss on some private creditors and that presumably, well, that definitely will not have to be paid by taxes, but to the extent uh, that he imposed losses on Bank of Italy, that will still come from taxes because it just means Bank of Italy will remit fewer profits and therefore uh, that will have to be covered with, uh, with taxes. This is going to work fine if the losses are not too big. Uh, things become more complicated um, if uh, you get to the point at which you need uh, these uh, uh, transfers to actually go negative, which means you need a recapitalization from the Italian Treasury to Bank of Italy um, because uh, the assets, the remaining assets, including future profits, um, are not enough to cover for this loss. If that happens, then uh, you would need a recapitalization. The question is, would that recapitalization be forthcoming? Um, so currently the rules for uh, uh, how these uh, profits are distributed from Bank of Italy are that 60% of its profits annually are remitted to the treasury minus a little bit of that goes to the banks that are te the technical owners uh, to, of uh, Bank of Italy, but the residual goes to the treasury. If 40% are kept as reserves. So, Bank of Italy has uh, some initial cushion that it can use, uh, which is a non-trivial cushion, as uh, um, I'm going to uh, mention. Um, the, uh, but once that's done, it's not clear. There's no automatic provision for recapitalization. So then, if somehow these uh, profits don't adjust, uh, these remittances don't adjust enough, and you can think, you know, these rules could be changed. These are set at the national level. They're not set at the central level. So what if those rules change for some reason, what are the other two escape valves? Uh, one is the target two liability. So suppose uh, Bank of Italy just does not uh, change uh, uh, its remit sentences, or it doesn't change them enough to account uh, for the losses that they make. Well, one of the things where this uh, would show up is uh, in an ever expanding target to balance. Um, and uh, so those could explode over time. Um, and then uh, if what happens if those explode? Well, there have, these uh, target two liabilities are a zero sum game between uh, Bank of Italy and the rest of the Euro system. So somebody else is having exploding assets and they will have to cut their own um, transfers uh, to their own treasury. So, to be concrete, let's say the Bundesbank would have to cut uh, transfers to the German uh, um, treasury. What if they don't cut either? Well, you know, budget constraints are budget constraints. Something has to give. At that point, at the central level, government, uh, the central bank policy would have to change. What's the most obvious change? Increase uh, money printing. But of course, if you start touching uh, money printing, 
then uh, uh, there is uh, an inflationary implication. So, you know, one of the implications, if you're not willing to tolerate this ever exploding uh, imbalance, is having higher inflation. Higher inflation is also it's shared uh, uh, a shared risk. Now, that was the case in which uh, banker uh, reserves uh, and uh, assets um, pay the same interest rate. So, there's no profit to be made. Uh, so you see, this is the present value of profits from having uh, uh, issuing bank reserves and uh, from having target two liabilities. These are the same. This term is not there. If that term is there, so if you actually the bank reserves or target two liabilities pay interest that is below the uh, risk-free rate of uh, of the economy, then uh, what happens is if you have a target two liabilities, you're actually. Uh, I, earning extra senior age profits. You're appropriating a greater share of the senior age profits that accrue to the system as a whole. And that's the alternative. So it may be that if the interest rate on uh, bank reserves, uh, on so the policy rate of DCB is sufficiently low, there's no reason why target two liabilities uh, should uh, explode over time. What's going to happen instead is that Bank of Italy is going to earn uh, bigger senior age profits on, uh, um, on their um, you know, on, on these liabilities. So they're going to essentially rebate uh, less money to these uh, Bundesbank and the Bundesbank uh, uh, correspondingly will will uh, earn a smaller share of these, uh, uh, these profits that accrue to the system as a whole. And that's another backdoor way in which uh, uh, the common budget constraint comes in and uh, leads uh, to mutualized risk. So I think I should uh, uh, wrap up. Um, I'm going to uh, briefly mention um, so the quantitative uh, uh, work is uh, is a work in progress. We do have an example. It's a very, 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 very benign ex example. And uh, I'll show you uh, to, to make that point and show you what happens to the target two balance. It goes down. So this is a default uh, by uh, Italy um, that causes the target two balance to go down just by a factor of 3%. I showed you that. Uh, we're sitting at minus 30 percent this is minus three just with minus three you need you get a spillover of nine percent of uh, uh, of the fiscal cost of the default being uh, borne by uh, the taxpayers uh, of countries uh, other than italy um, and so you know if as you design more stressful scenarios um, the the risk sharing is going to be uh, correspondingly bigger um, so the point of the talk here is that assessing these risk sharing principles is uh, complicated. It can, uh, depends on uh, um, on uh, a lot of uh, um, details. Um, and uh, the key question here remains uh, about thinking possibly about uh, coordinating and limiting uh, remittance policies at the central level if you want to have a stronger risk sharing. Um, and uh, uh, And so let me Leave it at that and open uh, the floor to questions. Yo, uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Marco. Uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, discussion, and and of course it's a fascinating topic which goes to the to the heart of uh, of monetary union. I know that uh, there is a question from from Leo von Tabben who always uh, says that we need more papers who really disentangle and look at money not just a single country single treasury single single center bank but which look into the details of monetary union and leo asked the question what is your view on the underlying normative question how to design qe in the euro area was the euro system right to design qe in a way which attempts to avoid loss sharing in the first place okay so you know, normative. Uh, uh, so I'm. My job is an economist. I'm <laughs> on the positive side. I mean, I do have normative papers, but from a more abstract perspective, because here the key question is a political question. Um, do we want more risk sharing? Well, I mean, we can uh, talk about in principle. Uh, you know, if you have uh, an abstract risk, uh, it's uh, people like insurance, so that. Uh, you know, sharing risk is great. But then, of course, we all realize that the moment we do that, there are also moral hazard questions. And so it's a, a 
whether the moral hazard is uh, big enough or small enough is uh, is uh, uh, what this is about. Um, we know that the European uh, uh, we we have uh, uh, rules at the European level. We we talked about them uh, in uh, in the panel at the beginning of this conference. Um, we know that they are imperfectly certainly imperfectly enforced. Sometimes for uh, good reasons. Sometimes uh, for uh, uh, reasons that are more complicated. Um, and so, do we believe that those are enough to get rid of uh, the question of moral hazard? Uh, presumably, when DCB uh, set up this arrangement of uh, limiting risk sharing, they were concerned that uh, these rules were not strong enough. Um, it's not my call. Um, it's uh, you know somebody. <laughs> it's the politicians' call at that point to evaluate whether this is uh, these rules. Uh, um, are or not, are not sufficient and also how they believe they will be enforced. Thank you, uh, Marco. That of your reply, of course, goes to the to the heart of the political, uh, say, policy issue. You know, that, uh, as you say, with your title, 40 budget constraints or, or 18 national center, uh, 19 national center bank, 19 treasuries. Uh, that, of course, uh, shows that whatever happens in this respect, when it comes to, you mentioned, mutualization, or say, who is losing, who is gaining, we are in this gray zone between, say, the monetary policy center bank balance sheet, no? which is, of course, uh, governed by the decisions of the center bank governing council, and the kind of fiscal implications that can have and which can be heterogeneous across uh, countries. So. So certainly that is an issue. In this respect, there is some there are some academics who say if there's no risk sharing in case of default, your example, so one country defaults, then if the central bank has more uh, assets, then it, and if say if QE starts, say that is hundred in a country, and uh, there is a fundamental risk of a default, say if if this happens. If the bad state uh, occurs, there would be a 40% debt relief needed. So that would mean 100 goes down to 60, a 40% haircut. Now, if you have the same fundamentals, but the central bank has bought, say, 20% of the bonds, if a 40 uh, haircut is needed or debt relief is needed to restore that sustainability in the bad state of the world, then with 20 on the on the uh, uh, on the budget of the national center bank, the haircut would have to be 50 on the private sector. So to, to have the same net uh, uh, reduction in, in debt or the same, the, the same uh, net uh, support for the future taxpayer. So that uh, people arguing, I think Daniel draws, if that is the case, then purchases by the center bank in such a monetary union uh, concept, in such a monetary union situation, should, if fundamentals were given, should increase the default premium which the market imposes on those uh, on those bonds which are still outstanding because uh, they have to fear that in case of a, of, a, of a bad state of the world happening and, and the default that the structure happening the private debt has to be hit harder in order to achieve the same debt relief for the taxpayer of the country concern what is your reply to this uh, assessment? Uh, i think that's uh uh you know that's correct to the extent that the risk is not shared so think about a one individual uh country um you know if uh, to the extent that uh the the bonds uh, the bonds are end up in uh, in the hands of uh, the individual central bank um can be defaulted on uh, well the one thing well, let me qualify that. I should. Uh, I should. I was a little bit too rash. There's always uh, an escape valve, uh, and actually, thinking about the individual country is a great example. So typically, what happens in those cases is uh, uh, inflation is the escape valve. Um, so uh, you know, if uh, we we do observe uh, uh, all the countries that uh, ran uh, large inflations, they ran large inflations because the uh, central bank was buying lots of uh, government bonds, in particular hyperinflations. That's that's a mechanism. Sometimes they bought um, private uh, bonds too. So, for instance, in the, the famous German hyperinflation, uh, the Bund, the Reichsbank, sorry, uh, was uh, buying government paper. If I remember correctly, discounting it at 15%, while you know inflation was some million percent, I don't remember the exact number. So as you can imagine, everybody went and discounted that 
So all the government bonds, other than uh, some uh, collector items, were in the hands of the Rice Bank. Uh, there was a limited amount of uh, discounting of private stuff at 30%. Of course, that also was discounted as much as possible. Um, so one way out is uh, it doesn't have to be a, uh, an actual haircut on the bond, private bond holders. It could be inflation. How does that play out in the euro system? That's different because uh, in the euro system, inflation requires uh, a choice that is made centrally. Um, and so at that point, you sort of have three mechanisms. One is uh, either these remittances from Bank of Italy to the Italian Treasury really go down. Uh, and then, yes, there is potentially uh, an increase in the risk of what remains on the books of the private sector. Or uh, somehow the European institutions agree on larger risk sharing. That's another possibility. Or the third is the larger risk sharing happens because uh, there's a little bit of extra inflation um, and that is a third possibility. Which one is going to play out? Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm just telling you the three options. No, no, no. Thank you very much. This is, of course, a very, very good reply. And, and nobody has a crystal ball, but therefore everybody in, in the euro system and the treasury is, is working to avoid the bad scenario where this default could ever be a realistic uh, risk, a uh, realistic big risk. There are other uh, very good questions. One from uh, Gernot Müller. Who asks? Who says it's a great paper? And he asks for the clarification: Is there also a transfer across countries in the monetary union implicit in QE in the absence of the fall risks? Just because central banks differ in how they transfer profits to their treasuries. So um, you can argue whether it is or it isn't, but it's true. So here's uh, one thing that is true. Um, to the extent that uh, Italy does not default and Germany does not default. And now Bank of Italy is buying Italian bonds that pay a higher interest rate than uh, German bonds. Um, those profits, so Bank of Italy is earning extra profits and those profits are not shared. So on the upside, you can, uh, um, it's, I think it's pretty likely that uh, I don't see why um, it's not Bank of Italy is going to remit those extra profits to the Italian Treasury. Um, and so, yes, in that sense, you can think that has distribution implications. Bank of Italy is making more profits than the German Bundesbank. But of course, you can also at the same time say, look, uh, this we are in the state in which uh, um, the, the Italian debt is being repaid. Those interest payments are being made by the Italian Treasury to the Bank of Italy. They come back to Bank of Italy to the Italian Treasury. Is that a transfer from the German taxpayer to the Italian taxpayer? You can argue no. Certainly, if the risk is isolated, so if in the in the loss scenario, it's the Italian taxpayer that is on the hook, that's exactly the way it should be working. But yes, that is saying the, the upside is not being shared. Uh, if the downside is being shared, that's kind of an extra worry that you may have. You're muted, Klaus. No, I no, I agree. Thank you for the answer. And I would just add that, but going back to the question from Leo von Tadden, uh, that the ECB having decided that most of the risk is not shared, uh, of course, has in that sense it has been helpful uh, to the Italian Treasury because the what you mentioned, the higher interest rates on Italian bonds are not shared within the system, but, but they accrue only to the or to, to, to the bulk of it to the Italian Treasury. And I would say, from from a principal point of view, conceptual to the extent that you that we you would argue that these risk premia are to some extent not reflecting fundamentals, but some kind of distortions or some kind of uh, self fulfilling a too high risk premium, it is it is also fully justified that they go back to uh, justify from a from a normative point of view that they go back to the to the Italian treasury. The next question which I uh, uh, have here is from I, I read them out both we still have five six, six minutes uh, can uh, one is from Jacopo can you rationalize the role of official assistance, for example, ESM loans in your analytical framework, work, thinking, for example, about the Greek uh, uh, debt crisis? And uh, if Papa has the question, the paper is very good, she says, as it is, 
I have learned a lot, but I was wondering how your model would fit the Greek crisis as well. So, so here, if you take your model, look back at the Greek crisis, what, what would you what would you say? It's, it's a very interesting thing. If I mention one thing, but I guess you know it certainly that in the case of it before, in order to inform the audience, uh, I have. I, I'm, I have been there. So before the Greek uh, debt restructuring, there was the S&P program of of the of the ECB. The S&P program was not this chaired. So one, when once the Greek program was uh, finalized in May 2010, one week later or so, the market was very volatile, and so the ECB decided to buy Greek bonds, although Greek was in the program, and Portuguese and Irish bonds. And, at, uh, and then two years later, there was this uh, PSI, the debt restructuring of Greece. But at that point in time, the ECB, the Euro system, and, the, and the, of course, the, the finance ministers uh, agreed that there would be no uh, default on the Greek bonds which the ECB had bought in order to stabilize the market. So that is, of course, in the history, a different situation than the one which we, which we currently have and, and which you were, were uh, uh, discussing. So, so much to the background. So now, now how you see it? So I think, uh, so per, uh, personally, I mean, this is strictly my view, but I, I like the idea of uh, uh, relying more on uh, uh, institutions like DSM and uh, um, explicitly making, so making more transparent where uh, risks are or are not shared. Um, I find uh, the current arrangement a bit opaque um, now, sometimes opacity is uh, deliberate. I'm not going to take a stance on whether that's the case in the, here or not. But um, having some, so if the risk is to be shared, certainly uh, I would like that to happen in an institution that is designed where, uh, with explicitly that purpose and uh, uh, where people can debate uh, about the merits and costs and benefits. And we talked about those. Uh, in the case of Greece, um, uh, as you mentioned, we don't really know whether the, the scenario that I'm analyzing didn't play out because uh, uh, the ECB was made whole. Um, and so we would not know how uh, this would have uh, played out if uh, the ECB uh, had incurred losses. The other thing, uh, so um, that part, um, I didn't go back and uh, do that in time, but were you, you were mentioning that that risk was also not supposed to be shared at that time. You're muted again, Klaus. It was no, no, when the S&P was designed, there was no mentioning, uh, as far as I know, but colleagues can correct me. I think there was no mentioning that the S&P uh, uh, risk would not be shared. But the point was, uh, I mean, it was not that the, the S&P purchases were on the center bank balance sheet. So, so Greece, uh, mm -hmm. Bank, uh, the Bank of Greece and, and, and uh, Bank of Portugal and uh, Irish Central Bank. That was not the case. They were on the, on the ECB balance sheet. Okay. And that came uh, as a certain surprise, uh, not only to the market, but also to the IMF, that the ECB said, uh, or that in the end, uh, the ECB was made whole, which means, of course, everybody was made whole, the whole system, nobody, right. not, not, not the Greeks yeah. and the bank had to suffer uh, any losses, and uh, also uh, not uh, the ECB itself. And in it, it, but there was, it's interesting from a political economy perspective, Marco, there was later a development where the, the profits which the ECB made on the, the profits, on the bonds, because they, they were purchased not, not at zero interest rate, mm -hmm. but at significant interest rates, and Greece honored this debt, Greece had to pay this debt, because there was no haircut. And then there was an agreement that the profits which the euro system or the ECB made, uh, because Greece was honoring this debt, these profits were given back, and not by the ECB, because that would have been monetary financing, but the the Treasuries of all member states agreed that they collectively would give back the profits to Greece. So, in a sense, that was, uh, I think, a nice, a, a nice uh, institutional decision to, to honor the fact that Greece would, would pay back its debt to, to, to the ECB. And then the, the Treasury said, We don't want the profit from the senior age from this, we give you back the senior age gains. That was an say, kind okay. of, and this giving back was done in a in a, in a way that it was linked to progress in the program or to, to, to reforms and so on. And that was assessed by the Eurogroup and the ESM and so on. 
So it's, it, it's quite an interesting twist. So asking the question, please, gives you even more. You could write a second paper <laughs> to, to apply your, your, uh, your, your model. Uh, any, any, any further say, I, I'm looking here, whether there are further questions. No, there are no further questions. So a final, say, a final reaction by you, uh, Marco, to, to what, what we just discussed or more generally. Uh, no, I, I want to thank you for organizing this uh, this uh, great session, um, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I think we kind of learned uh, the details, uh, again, looking at Greece, uh, the details of how these things uh, uh, play out matter a lot, and so it's worth thinking about. Okay, thanks a lot. I would want to, to, to thank you, Marco, and uh, you, Efi, and Earl, for, for the wonderful discussion we had this, this afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers. I see here on the screen just uh, Jacopo, but also the, the, the other colleagues who, who were working, uh, uh, Maria and, uh, and, and uh, 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 Jan Leonano, and, uh, and Demos, I mean, and uh, um, Leo. I, I think I, I have not uh, forgotten anybody. Thanks a lot, everybody, for organizing this, and thank you for uh, Marco, Efi, and Owen for the for the wonderful discussion. I, I wish everybody good uh, good uh, evening and afternoon. Uh, and uh, Jacopo, do you want to make any any further uh, uh, remarks, or because I just want uh, to thank also on on the side of the organizer, all the participants. I think it was a, a great uh, afternoon, and thanks for, in particular to the speakers and the and the discussant. And uh, just uh, to mention that I hope uh, we hope to see you all tomorrow at 2 p.m. We resume with the keynote lecture by Ricardo Reis. And uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. Thanks, Klaus, for an excellent chairman. Thank you, Thanks. and thank you, Marco. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.